which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, ce que nous avons vu de nos yeux, which we have looked upon, es lo que hemos mirado, and our hands have touched, the word of life. this letter to Titus to instruct and strengthen him. Titus had a challenging job of bringing order to a church that was located on an island well known for general disorderliness. Welcome to the Amazing Collection. As you know, we are in the letters to the pastors. The other day, I was listening to my son talking to some of his friends about my famous last words. And one of the stories he told on me happened when he was about five years old. He was on the church playground and begging me to help him go across the monkey bars yet again. And by that time, I was kind of weary and my back was hurting. So I said, son, what is the worst thing that can happen? Just go for it. So with all of his little courage, he climbs up on the monkey bars, takes a diving leap, completely misses and breaks both arms. Oh That's the worst thing that can happen. <laughs> Reminded me of the famous last words of a sentimental millionaire. On his deathbed, he called his whole family around and they leaned in and he very sweetly said, remember, Buy low and sell high. <laughs> or the famous last words of the missionary who said, So, you're a cannibal. <laughs> well, today in the book of Titus, we are going to study some of Paul's last words. Although these are very special and they're very precious and they're very urgent. And it's very similar to the letters he wrote to Timothy only his whole focus in this book is order in the church. And the neat thing about this book is how practical it is for us in this day and age. He is speaking to us from way back then on how to order our lives and order our church. Now, he probably wrote this letter in 63 AD from Corinth to a little island called Crete. And on your map, you can see it. It's the fourth largest island in the Mediterranean Sea, and it's just south of the Aegean Gulf. You can see it just below the Aegean Sea. Now, he had a very specific way to get these letters to Timothy and Titus. And this time, he probably used Zenos and Apollos, who were on their way back all the way around all the churches that he'd already founded to deliver messages. And though this is a personal message to his sweet protege, Titus, it's also to be read to the church. It's only three little chapters. I think you'll really enjoy it. It's a very good book. Now, 
we know less about Titus than we did about Timothy. And as you know, we didn't know a lot about Timothy. But what we do know about Titus is all good. He shows genuine devotion, not just to Paul, but to the cause of Christ. He's committed to those he served. He never left until his job was done and the church was set in order. And he was effective and promising. Now, the interesting thing about him is we never hear about him in the book of Acts. And yet he's mentioned 13 times in Paul's letters. Isn't that neat? Titus, as you recall, is the fellow we read about in the book of Galatians. He was a living illustration to that church. A long time ago, Paul had taken him back and said, this is a Greek man. He has not been circumcised and he will not be circumcised because you don't need to be circumcised to be a Christian. You can be a real Christian and still be Greek. So he was actually a living example. He was the person they referred to when they talked about freedom in Christ. Titus was also very instrumental in the role of the church in Corinth. Now, you studied that church. I think it was one of those situations that probably drove Paul nuts. And he had Timothy there to help train this church. Well, Timothy was very timid, and he wasn't getting through. So Paul sent down the other gun, Titus, to help set that church in order. And he must have been very gracious and diplomatic, and yet still had a mantle of authority because he actually accomplished that which Paul had sent him down there to do. Now on this little island, Paul's very specific about the task he wants Titus to complete. He's saying, first of all, I want you to put this church in order. That's the main theme of the book. But he also gave him this letter to prove his authority. He was a young man. And though he was knowledgeable in the scriptures and in the ways of Christendom, Paul was using this letter to be an extension of his blessing. So he had this letter as proof that he was actually Paul's representative on this little island. And the, this is a huge job he had because these Cretans were known as the most immoral people around. You've heard the expression, even nowadays we'll say, he is such a Cretan. Well, it has true horrible origins. It really does. These people were known as gluttons as drunkards, they were lazy, and they were immoral. And Paul's saying, hey, fellas, you're not supposed to be acting like Cretans anymore. You're supposed to be acting like Christians. And he knew Titus had a big job. So if you haven't already, go ahead and open your Bibles and get out your outline because we're going to get into division number one, which is all of chapter number one. Division number one is the protection of sound doctrine in the church. So he's specifically looking at protecting the doctrine within the church. Part A, Paul instructs Titus to ordain qualified leaders in the church. In verse five of chapter one, he sets forth his aim and his purpose and he doesn't mince his word. He says this, for this reason I, Paul, left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint the elders in every city as I directed you." Now he's leaving him a huge job. This took place shortly after Paul had been released from prison and they went around to check on the churches. Well, they got to Crete and Paul said, I'm gonna have to leave you behind. You are wise in these ways. But this was a very complicated procedure. And Paul had given him very specific things to look for. He was looking for a few good men. And Paul goes on to describe what they look like. Your first blank is overseers. Now the overseers were literally the bishops or the pastors of the church. They had special responsibilities as the superintendents of each little church in each little city. The second is elders or senator, or as we say, older one. And that means not just in chronological age, but aged in their spiritual maturity. They would need to be looked up to as leaders, as apostles. Deacons was the other one. Servant of someone is what it literally means, the helper. They were the hands and feet in the church. They were the practical agents and they dealt more within the congregation. Now, why would you need so many different kinds of jobs? Well, first of all, nobody has all the spiritual gifts that are needed to run a growing and flourishing church. Paul knew that. He wanted Titus to find men that would be good in each one of these roles. Also, nobody can be close to every single member of a congregation and know all of their needs and ways to help them practically. 
So Paul's saying, Titus, find people in different roles. Nobody is perfect. We are humans. Apart from Christ, nobody's perfect. So they needed to have people in different roles of leadership for checks and balances, for accountability and for correction. And lastly, that no one person can exemplify all of the gifts of the Spirit. And so Paul is saying, set up people in positions of leadership that represent the body, all functioning together with different strengths and gifts. Basically, as a judge would say, order in the court. Paul is saying, order in the church. That is what you need. God is a God of order, and he wants order in his church, so you must find qualified, capable men. Now, if I were Titus, I'd be thinking, okay, now I have the list, and you've told me what to do, but how can I know the heart of man? How can I, Titus, measure the maturity of other people? And Paul goes on to help him, even in that. He says there are ways. If they are invested in the church already, observe them. And he gives him three practical ways. In part B, Paul ordered Titus to choose leaders whose overall character is blameless. And he has him look in three different areas. The first is domestically, how he looks at home with his family. The second blank, personally, is he respected in the community? Is he respected at work and at play? And lastly, doctrinally, does he know what it is he says he believes? Now, as women, we know it's true that home life counts. And Paul is basically saying, if this man cannot run his own home, if this man has not evangelized his own home, if his home is not a kind, committed Christian community, he has no business leading a church. So check out their home life. Go home with them after church, worship, feast with the family. Secondly, personally, he wants to know what do his friends say about him? What do his neighbors say about him? Is he respected at work? Is he trusted? Is he godly? Is he self-controlled? Is he dedicated? Is he compassionate? Does he make a difference in his community? He's giving him specifics to look for. And then doctrinally. Now, if there were to be an extra word in division number one, it would be knowing or to know. He wants to know if these people Titus is picking know the word, study the word. Cretans were known for being lazy. You cannot be lazy and know the doctrine. You need to know things like the personality of God and Jesus Christ as Savior and that he's fully God and fully man and to be able to explain these truths. He wanted to find someone that was a student of the Word and the Scriptures. Now, in the FBI, we know that when they are trying to research counterfeit bills, they don't study the false bills. What do they do? They study the real bills. That's right. They study the true thing. That's what he's saying. Find men that know the truth, that study the truth, that invest in the truth and know the doctrine. He had two points in mind. First of all, he knew that pretty soon the Roman government was going to make Christianity illegal. They were going to oppose Christians. So he wanted strong men in place for his little churches on the island of Crete. But secondly, for the inside of the church. Look at point C with me. Paul encouraged Titus to rebuke false teachers in the church. Now, I know it seems like we mention this every week. And that's mainly because we do. <laughs> but it was a huge problem. Everywhere ch that Paul went to set up a church, the Judaizers came in and undermined his authority and twisted the doctrine. He's saying, do not allow them to do that. Put them out. Look at verse 16 of chapter 1. Paul is talking about these false teachers and he says, They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. He wanted people that knew the truth and then acted it out. These people did not know the truth. That's why he calls them false. That's the opposite of truth. These false teachers were infiltrating the church, undermining Paul's authority, teaching circumcision, which Titus, again, is the living illustration that you do not need to be circumcised to be a true Christian. He was mis they were misleading the people. They were taking money for their false teaching. Paul never took money for his teaching. He was a tent maker. That's how he supported himself. He didn't want to take money. These men insisted on being paid. 
and he says they were wreaking havoc in whole houses. Now, if they're wreaking havoc in, havoc in whole houses, that literally means they were destroying churches. In those days, they didn't have what we think of as church buildings. They met in homes. So besides dividing homes and families, they were literally destroying the churches. Now, these were not bad men. They were probably sincere and they probably thought they were doing the right thing, but they were sincerely mistaken and they were leading people astray. It's not that they were atheists or agnostics or humanists. They weren't. They were very, very religious. They looked good. They knew the Old Testament and they were misleading people because they didn't really know about Christ and freedom in Christ. This still happens now. There are many sincere Christian cults. They're sincere, but like the Judaizers, they're sincerely wrong. They look good, but they teach a twisted, distorted gospel. It still happens. False teachers come on and they add to the truth. That's why it's so important, as Paul's saying, to know the truth, know the doctrine, or you will be misled like these people were. I had a friend who was pursued by a very sincere, very religious group that called themselves Christian, and they kept misleading her. And she said, well, I'm just kind of interested because if they know the truth, I want to be open to that. Well, after a couple years of really reading her Bible, studying her Bible, and listening to what they said, she realized they were not teaching truth. They were false teachers. And the quote about herself is she said, I had become so open-minded that my brains were falling out. And when she started to compare their false teaching to true doctrine, she realized that they were just like these Judaizers. Now in division number two, Paul is going to switch gears. He's going to talk about the practice of sound doctrine. And again, this is in the church. This is chapter two. And this is all about application, which is what we're real strong on in the Amazing Collection. It's not good enough just to know it. You got to show it. You got to know how to live it out. And he wants them to do that. He wants them to live out sound doctrine. Now, his main theme in all of chapter two is to teach and to train. If chapter one is to know it, this chapter is to show it, to show it to people within the church. Now, our idea of education and the Hebrew idea of education are completely different. They had life training. They had life on life. It's all based back in Deuteronomy. When you would walk along, you'd talk about God. When you sat down and you laid down, you'd train your children practically. They would see you live out the truth. It was not just imparting knowledge. It was not about intellect. It was about living out the doctrine and the truth. Well, Paul was a good Jew. This is exactly what he had done for Titus and Timothy. He took them under his wing. He knew the word. He trained them in the word. Everywhere they walked, every church they went, they saw him live it out. And he is challenging these guys, especially Titus, to do the same thing. Live it out like I did before you. Allow them to see you model it. See, if intellect was the most important thing, he would have just picked the smartest guys in the church. But that's not what he's saying. It's not just knowledge. It's not just transcript. Titus looked for godly men of character who model it, who show what they know, who live it out. Part A, Paul directed Titus to teach older men and women to mentor the younger men and women. Now, since we basically looked at the role of the men in chapter one and we're chicks, I want us to look more at the role of women in chapter two. He has a neat challenge for women. If you have your Bibles open, look at chapter two, and we're gonna look at verses three through five. This is Paul writing to Titus and he says, tell the older women likewise, that they are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. Now, the island of Crete was known for their vineyards and the people of Crete were known as drunkards. They partook of that wine a little too much. And he's saying, women, you need to be restrained. You need to be temperate. You do not need to be indulging. And younger women need to see you live this out. Look at verse four. So that they may encourage young women to love their husbands and their children. 
that, that was a revolutionary idea. This was a very immoral community. It was a very self-focused community. And so to put others before yourself, that was a new thought. And not only that, but notice the order. It's husbands, then children. Say so women love them well. Love them well. Even nowadays, that's considered old-fashioned. Well, for this community, that was unheard of. What would the world look like if we changed this, if we applied this as women, truly loved the men that God had given us, and those children who are following us and watching our example. He's challenging the women to do this. Verse five, be sensible, pure workers at home, be kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. There's the goal. The word of God would be uplifted. People would believe it if they could see you showing what you say you know. I want you to listen to Karen Loritz tell her story. This is a woman who actually had this lived out for her. She didn't have the role model in her home, but God saw fit to give her that role model within the church. Older women that embraced her and rallied around her and trained her, became her mentor in truth. My mother was an unwed teenage young girl. She found herself pregnant and she gave birth to me 30, 55 years ago. For the first 30 days of life, I was hooked up to machines and they didn't think I was gonna live, but I did live and she brought me home. Several years later, my mother found herself pregnant again uh, by another man and we therefore lived in public housing. My mother tried to work, she was on welfare for a little bit, but life was really tough for us. I found myself overwhelmed and probably as a young teenage girl, I decided I'm just gonna, just gonna sleep away. I just wanted to die. So I collected some of my mother's pills. My mother had a, a chronic illness and I collected some of her pills and I decided one day I'm gonna go to that medicine cabinet, take that handful of pills and just sleep away and just wake up in, with, into heaven with God. That's what I wanted to do. But when it came time for me to take that handful of pills, I was chicken because I didn't want to choke to death. I just wanted to sleep. I decided that that's a bad way to do it. I would leave my little brothers and everything was just, just resolved at that time. But at the end of that particular summer when as a young teenage girl, I decided to run away. Um, I was just really tired of just being the big responsibility there in the home. And so I decided to run away. But when it came time for me to run away, I thought of my little brothers. I thought of my grandmother and my aunt and my mom, and I just couldn't do it. Well, even though I was in a good church, um, I had um, several people that just loved and cared for us. Um, we were different from everyone there in the church. There's a, a congregation that was a majority white church, but that didn't matter. They just loved us and included us in all their events. Um, they invited us to go to a youth rally downtown in Philadelphia, and I decided to do that because that was going to be fun. He opened up the Bible, and he opened to this particular verse, John 3, 16. And out of those 4,000 plus young people there, it was as though he was mentioning my name, Karen. And he talked about that God loved me. And that's what I needed to hear. Because even though I knew my, knew my mother loved me, and my aunt, and my grandmother, and my other family members just loved and adored me, I never heard them say that they loved me. And when he talked about the love of God, it was as though the whole of my heart, the loneliness and being alone that was in my heart, it seemed as though it was being filled by God. So I know I wasn't the first, but maybe I was the second out of all those people there in the audience. And I went down, shook that gentleman's hand, and prayed to receive Christ. And then a young lady took me downstairs. She sat on, she sat on my left-hand side and opened her little Bible, and she introduced me to, to God. Within that same church, um, there were several people that sort of took me under their wing through junior high school, high school, and college, and after I graduated. First of all, um, there were several women. It was, I never forget, it was Miss Betty Nichols. Miss Nichols loved me. I remember all the times coming over to her house and as she would feed her goldfish, she would talk to me about the love of God. She really showed evangelism in a special way because she took me when she went witnessing and she would always talk about having energy to do whatever God wanted you to do. And Miss Ent Wilson, she was single. She didn't have any children, of course, but she took me as her child. Next, when I finished junior high school, I went to high school and would you know, God had someone else there at the church, another woman. And this was my high school teacher. This was Mrs. Bourne. Mrs. Bourne was married. She was a wife. She was a worker there at Channel in the Mission. And she was, unfortunately, she did not have any children. But guess what? She took me as her child. 
and she took me through those years in high school when I was still kind of wondering, you know, about my purpose in life. Things were a little bit better at home um, with my mother and stepfather. There was a little law in some of the, um, the, the atmosphere in, in home, but I think because I was growing there at the church that I was able to put things in proper perspective. Well, wouldn't you know that God has something special for me? Because he knew that I was going to be leaving high school. I had not a clue as to what I was going to do. I met this lady within our church who happened to be the Christian service director at Philadelphia College of Bible. And she just took me under her wing. She just felt as though, first of all, I needed to have a husband. You're going to go to Bible college, you need to have a husband. She showed me over and over and over again that God has had a plan for me. Well, the pastor's wife, Miss Vera Kowalczyk, she was a hoot. She didn't have any children even. All these ladies, Miss um, Nichols, Miss Bourne, Miss Entwistle, and Mrs. Kowalczyk, none of them had any children. They all took me under their wing. I guess that was their special project. But Mrs. Kowalczyk had this um, ministry called King's Daughters and King's Sons. And we met every month at her house. And she showed me hospitality. She showed me a love for the Word of God. I mean, she could quote scriptures. So those four women really invested their lives in me. I mean, it was nothing ever um, formal. They never sat down and said, Karen, you have to learn these things because one day you're going to need them. Only thing that they did, they took those teachable moments just to share the love of God with me. And when I think of that scripture in Titus 2 that talks about training on women and telling them to love their husbands, and for sure I'm having a sensibility towards God and honoring God, I'll never forget those women. Now, my responsibility, I'm a mother of four children, two girls particularly, and I have two daughters-in-law that I have just said that they're going to be my um, little disciples too. How that I can just informally just love them, show them the Word of God, and give them the compassion that God has placed on my heart, that women will just love their families, love God, and serve all over the world. Now, since we're talking about the definition of mentor and teaching and training, I wanted to give you a few words to fill in your blanks so that you can see the subtle differences in the definitions. Number one, to train, is really the act of instruction. It connotates a older, younger woman, a mentor-type relationship. And I always tease Pat and Eleanor and Lyndon and say, they're my older women, much older women. <laughs> Number two, to encourage to give hope, to urge, to help develop. Example, now that is the visual impression. That is the living illustration, to be an example for another woman. To teach, now that is the verbal instruction. That is the imparting of knowledge. That is doing a discipleship program with them and sitting down and studying the word together. And then to rebuke. And that's not always harsh. That's not always harshly reproving someone. That can be bringing something to light and exposing truth. All of these are shaping lives. It's life on life. It's walking together. It's showing what you know. Basically what he's saying is make sure your behavior doesn't just convict, but it inspires others. Part B. Paul insisted that Titus train younger men and women to be self-controlled. That would have been a big deal in this immoral and indulgent society. Again, it was all about sex and drinking and gluttony. That was the Roman culture. And he's saying, if you are self-controlled, you will look different. And you need to teach others to be self-controlled. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And the truth is, self-control is an important aspect of maturity in Christ learning to control your desires and your wants and your will and to resist temptation. He's saying you'll show what you know if you look self-controlled. Point C, Paul told Titus to teach the slaves to be obedient and trustworthy. Again, that would have been a cultural difference. In those days, the slaves wanted to get away with as much as they could. These, they were mistreated and abused most of the time. So the way to get back is they would steal. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. When you are a Christian, you have a whole new creed. You have to show what you know. And if you know the truth, and if you know honesty and purity and godliness, you, you can't partake in that anymore. You cannot be a thief anymore. And then he says one of the most beautiful things. He says, adorn the doctrine. When you do this, you are 
adorning the doctrine. And to me, it's like putting a beautiful frame on a beautiful picture. He's saying, slaves, let your lives adorn the gospel. Let your lives emulate the beauty of Christ. In division number three, Paul's going to change his focus. Now he's on, had spent these two chapters on the church. His focus will now be in the world. Division number three, the participation in sound doctrine in the world. So if the first division was to know and the next one was to show in the church, this one would be to show the world. Now he uses repeated phrases like good works and good deeds and being profitable and being fruitful because if you're doing those things, then other people can see how the gospel has beautifully affected your life. Most commentators agree that Paul did not found these churches, that by now they're two and three generations removed. Uh, it's not a novelty. Christianity isn't really a novelty anymore to these people. If you remember back in Acts, when Peter was speaking at Pentecost, there were Cretans there. They believe, commentators and scholars believe, that many believed upon the Lord and brought their faith back to the island of Crete. But when Paul shows up, he's saying, wait a minute, we got to raise the bar here. You're calling yourselves Christians, but you're still looking like Cretans. I want you to be looking different. You need to look different to the world. Christian doctrine needs to be linked with a higher conduct than I see in you. So he's asking Titus to encourage them to look different now to the world. Point A, Paul required all members to obey the law of the land. In other words, he's saying, in order to be a good citizen in heaven, you need to be a good citizen on earth. That is a good work. You must be submissive to authority. You don't want to look like a Cretan. You want to look like a Christian. Point B, Paul reminded the believers of why they should do profitable good works. And he reminds them, he goes back to the origin and says, remember, you were Cretans in every sense of the word. Then you were converts. You became Christians. And now you are called children of God. You are representing God, your Father. You have a new name. You have a new identity. That's what we want you to look like to the world. Then he goes on to use expressions like patterns of good works, be zealous in good works, be ready to do every good work, and be careful to maintain those good works. Now, in the same token, in the same vein, if they haven't gotten it yet, point C, Paul demands that the congregation avoid the unprofitable and the useless. Again, they're being represented to the world. He wants them to look different. And he says, speak evil of no man, do not be quarrelsome, avoid controversies, and do not criticize each other. That's what all the other Cretans do. I want you to look like Christians. Look in verse 14 of chapter 3. He leaves them with a warning. Chapter 3, verse 14. Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds, there it is again, to meet the pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. He knew that the committed Christian church needed to show what they know, not just to one another, but to a world that desperately needed to see the difference. I heard um, a story about a pious church member who was invited to speak to the junior department by the superintendent. And he shows up in this room with all these kids and very arrogantly says, do you know why people call me a Christian? which was met with a very long, embarrassing silence until finally one of the kids in the back row stood up and said, probably because they don't know you. <laughs> Those are not the famous last words that you or I once spoken about us. Those are not the famous last words that Paul wanted the people of Crete to hear about them. We need to know and we need to show a Christ-like life. Thank you.